Hello, welcome to my little trip down road test in memory lane. It's another Q&A video today, so thank you very much for all your questions and comments. They're hugely appreciated and really, really interesting. Um, so let's crack on with the first one, which is from Keith Waller. Thanks very much for your question. Excellent channel, thank you very much. Just a thought on um, sports bikes, why they're so uncomfortable is the far and foot peg position due to super bike rules. Do they have to be like a street bike? Well, that is a really interesting question, actually, Keith. Um, there's no reason why I think sports bikes need to be so uncomfortable. Um, you know, you could say that um, these bikes, like race replicas, like Fireblades, for example, are made predominantly for racing, and they just so happen to sell them for the road rider as well. Um, but the truth is, when you turn any road bike into a race bike, you change everything anyway. Even if it's a club racing bike or a super stock bike, one of the first things you do is change the, the clip-ons, the handlebars, to make them stronger, uh, to make them more adjustable, um, to make them easier to repair in a crash. Um, and for that reason, when you have handlebars on a race bike, you can set them really wide, really close, you can kind of move them up and down on the fork leg a little bit. Um, and then you've got screens. Most road bike screens are very, very low, with the exception of the Panigale. Um, again, when you turn a sports bike into a racing bike, you generally put on a bigger screen so you can get tucked right in underneath. Um, the foot pegs on a road bike, you're not allowed to use road bike foot pegs when you're racing because they flip up. So you have to run rear sets, and rear sets are generally adjustable. And then you've actually got the racing bodywork. Racing seat units can be a different height to a road bike seat unit. You generally have firmer foam on them as well. So a racing bike feels nothing like a road bike. And you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to, to ride some very, very nice racing bikes indeed. And I would say that with the exception of the really small riders, most racing bikes are more roomy than their sports bike cousins. You know, I, I just think back to riding Johnny Ray's bike. Johnny Ray's bike so spacious because, because he wants to kind of move around. It is the polar opposite to a ZX-10. So it's a real odd thing that I can't really fathom that manufacturers make their sports bikes so tiny for I don't know who. And then that puts off the majority of riders that can't fit on them anymore. And I think if, if they weren't so cramped, they would be a little bit more popular. Okay, they're very, very fast now and quite irrelevant for the road. And they're very, very expensive. Um, but I think they could be more comfortable. I mean, the most comfortable sports bike probably, in terms of roominess, um, is a Panigale. Although the seat's quite hard and the bars are quite low, but you've got lots and lots of leg room. The R1 is similar, quite a lot of leg room, but a very hard seat, very low bars. Um, ZX10, really uncomfortable, especially the newer generation ones, which were even more cramped than before, bizarrely. I mean, who are they designed for? Um, blades are very, very uncomfortable. G6Rs and S1000RRs are probably the most kind of comfortable sports bikes. When you throw in cruise control, which means you can kind of let go of the bars every now and then to shake your wrist off, um, they're probably the most comfortable sports bikes. Um, and then you've got the new generation, you've got like an R7 and an RS660, they're more comfortable because they've got higher bars, but they haven't got the get up and go of a superbike. So yeah, it's a real shame that manufacturers do that. And from what I can see, absolutely no reason why they should have low screens, low bars and cramped pegs. You know, I can't quite work that out. Um, but thanks very much for your question. The next one is from Ducky Lucky, <laughs> when you're outside the UK testing bikes in countries where they drive on the right side of the road, how hard is it not to inadvertently end up on the wrong side of the road? Well, thanks very much for your question, Ducky Lucky. Um, most of the time, for some reason, you don't get confused. I mean, there's no clue on a motorbike that you should drive on a certain side of the road like there is a car. You know, the handlebars and everything are in the same place, whether you drive on the left or the right. Um, I've got into trouble a couple of times. The only times 
I really sit and think about what side of the road I should be on is when we're doing photo shoots in the UK. I'll pull away from sort of the corner we're photo shooting on and then kind of freeze. And sometimes I've had to pull in and wait for a car to come just to remind myself what side of the road I should be on. My brain goes in a complete freeze. But that doesn't happen very often. But it has happened to me twice, bizarrely, in exactly the same place, probably 10 years apart. Uh, and that's on the road, the Panoramica Road between Riccioni and Ancona in Italy, um, pulling away from a place called G Gabici de Mare. And I've pulled away on the English side of the road, going down this steep hill with a load of bends in it. And both, well, the first time, nothing happened. Uh, and I'd been around a few blind left-handers, which is dodgy, on the left-hand side of the road. Um, but one time I've actually pulled away on the left when I should have pulled away on the right. And a car's coming the other way and I've had to just stop and we've both stopped. But only at low speed, fortunately. Um, I've also seen other road testers. I've seen a colleague of mine, Matt Wildy, pulled out of a petrol station in Germany ages ago and went herring off down the English side of the road. And there was a car coming the other way and his arms and legs were off the bike, just panicking, but he managed to swerve out of the way in time. Um, and I think it's our old editor, Mark Potter, actually on a launch in Spain and went herring off down the road on the English side of the road and actually had a head on with the car, but was fortunately injured, but okay. But yeah, it does, uh, it does happen. Um, yeah, you've got to think long and hard before you pull away sometimes. But great question. Thank you very much, Ducky Lucky. Um, Andrew Lucas. Hi, mate. Fantasy thought. Suzuki bring out a new GSX-R750 with modern electronics, VVT and active suspension. I like this. Uh, try and bring out a Daytona 6, uh, 765. An MV update the F3 800. And oh yeah, KTM do an RC8890 and Yamaha an R9. How would you enjoy that group test? I think that would probably be my dream group test, actually. Um, these middle capacity, middle weight, whatever you want to call them, sports bikes, you know, they always were. The GSX-R 750 was always the, the best sports bike. It, it kind of still is, really, but it feels a little bit outdated compared to modern stuff. But, you know, the... The philosophy is there, and, and if you ride a lot of naked middleweights like street triples and MT09s and that kind of thing, they're kind of mo the most fun, sporty bike really you can have. They're really light and flickable. They've got enough power to have a lot of fun with, but not too much, so they're intimidating. They're not too expensive. So the thought of Suzuki bringing out a tasty GSX-R750 fills me with joy. You know, as does uh, a really well sorted Daytona uh, 765. Triumph have nearly done it with the Moto 2 edition of the Street Triple, but it hasn't got a fairing and it's just quite strange to ride. Um, and then, of course, um, an F3800, they're fantastic handling bikes and sound beautiful. And an RC8890, I mean, probably, you know, any circuit would be amazing for those, not just small circuits you know even if you were take on a long circuit and just you know be flat out down the straights being able to slipstream you know use a little bit of riding craft which you don't on a super bike they just blast down the straights you've got to stop them dead you've got to turn them and fire them out they're kind of just a bit more brutish whereas smaller bikes like these you can be a little bit more dainty and a little bit controlled and a little bit more thoughtful and um, they're a little bit safer when you're at the limit i mean what would be my favourite track to do those on? Somewhere like Hareth would be amazing, or in the UK, Brands GP, Alton Park, Cadwell, most tracks really. Um, but I think that is one group, to, and of course the road. I mean, they'd be fantastic on the road, especially if the clip-ons weren't too low and they're more comfortable, as we were saying before. Um, but I think that's one group test that I would not want to stop doing. I think I'd have to um, twist the arms of the editors at MCN to see if we could uh, test them for a couple of weeks instead of just a couple of days. But I think what you've described there is probably, you know, a dream collection of, of sports bikes. And 
bikes like that could bring people back to sport, sporty bikes, couldn't they? Because, I mean, they're pretty much dead now anyway. Um, I'd rather have any of those bikes than a new ZXR400 or ZX4RR or a ZX6R, you know, because they don't really bring anything new to the party, whereas stuff like this, I think, would be absolutely incredible. Um, but thanks very much for your question. That is a great one. Next from Jeff Ball, 9547. Hi Jeff, thanks for your question. I bought my first twin, a Z650 RS for comfort and beauty, uh, and coming out of a lifetime of inline fours and struggling with the amount of engine braking in corners. Would it make any sense to map the bike to cut out some of the engine braking or just relearn how to ride this thing? <clears throat> well, of course, um, a Z650 RS is a, is a parallel twin. Um, and it's going to have a lot more engine braking than, than a four. You've got two big pistons instead of four little ones. Um, they don't rev as high um, like a four cylinder. So when you cut the throttle, you're going to get a lot of engine braking. Um, it's the character of the engine. There's not much you could do with mapping, I don't think. Um, most engine braking control systems when it comes to electronics, electronically open the throttle butterflies to let out some of the engine compression to give that kind of freewheeling effect which i think with a, a standard bike just with mapping fuel mapping i don't really think you could do to any kind of significant amount um, so there are two things you could do or three things you could do number one is get a slipper clutch and um, i think these bikes have got a slip and assist clutch anyway but you could get a more racy slipper clutch that really allows more freewheeling into corners when you come off the throttle. You could replicate a slipper clutch by actually pulling the uh, clutch lever in slightly as you're going into corners, which would give exactly the same effect. So that will help you freewheel into the corners more. Um, or just learn to ride the bike a little bit differently. So really that means not stomping down so many gears when you go into corners and um, you know just just maybe going through corners a gear higher than you would normally on a four cylinder which you can kind of get away with on a on a twin anyway um, and that kind of will cut down on on the engine braking um, but there's not a lot you can do but i wouldn't let that spoil your enjoyment of that bike it's a it's a great bike i can see why you got it they're really cool looking actually aren't they um, but yes, yeah, just a question of maybe just riding it slightly differently to you with your four cylinder, you know, fewer down changes and just kind of be a little bit more lazy with the gears and go through the corners with, with lower revs. So you're not getting that engine braking. Um, but yeah, let me know how you get on with that. Thanks for the question. Uh, next one is from Joseph Seles. Um, thanks for the question. Love this series and your writing. Thank you very much. Keep up the great work. I will. Um, as a bike tester, were there ever any bikes you wish you could go back in time and change your rating on? Maybe models that grew on you or models that lost their luster over time? Mm, great question. Well, I don't think I've got any regrets about any um, opinions I've had on bikes over the years. Um, you know, when, you, when you're testing bikes they normally you know they talk to you quite quickly and you know your initial impressions are normally the ones that kind of hold over over time I've found um, and like I've said before you what we do is just opinion based it's just our opinion on what a bike's like there's no right or wrong opinion it's just what you think um, but I suppose the closest I've ever got to kind of questioning my opinion would be the launch of the Suzuki GSX-R 1000 K7. So <clears throat> the GSX-Rs, thousands from their inception, K1, K3, K5, and bear in mind we're in this kind of big super bike kind of frenzy and bubble of excitement and massive sales in the mid noughties. Um, the GSX-R steadily got better and better and better and more powerful, more goodies, more of everything, better handling. Uh, and the K7 promised to be case in points, had more power than the, the K5. Um, it had those twin exhausts, started to adhere to Euro rules. There was promises of more revs, more excitement, better handling. 
Um, so Suzuki took us to Phillip Island for the launch. It's an amazing track, obviously, an amazing experience to go there. And they flew us all the way to Australia. And we had our day on track um, to test the bike, two sessions in the morning, two sessions in the afternoon. Um, but what happened when we got there, after going through all the briefings, all the Aussie health and safety, and there's a lot of it in Australia, um, it rained in the morning and we didn't get to ride the bike in the morning. There were no wet tires and we just had to sit and look at the bikes. Eventually, it dried up for the afternoon and we got our afternoon sessions um, and we actually finished up early. I think we were done by three, four o'clock, something like that. But there was the track was still open till five, half five, but we weren't allowed to go out on the bikes again. They just stuck to their schedule. Um, so we went all the way to Australia for two 15, 20 minute sessions on the bike. And I got a pretty good idea of what the bike was like. We got to ride it pretty hard. I knew Phillip Island pretty well, hit the ground running. Uh, and I was racing a G6R 1000 at a time, so I could really make that comparison. Um, and I really, really liked it. In hindsight, once we got it back to the UK and once we did our group tests, it turned out that it was a little bit on the heavy side. It turned out that it didn't quite have the grunt of the K5 and it wasn't quite as pure, but it was still very, very good. And I think that if I'd have had more time on the bike in Australia, I might have come to that conclusion sooner. So I don't regret anything I say about the K7, but I think that with more time on the bike, I might have been a tiny bit more critical. Um, as it turned out, it was um, overshadowed by the R1, the 16-valve R1, and then the 08 blade overshadowed it, and then the 09 R1, and then the S1000, and really after that, the G6R1000 never really got a look in. The weirdest thing about that launch was while we were all sitting around in the pits in the afternoon after our sessions, and we all wanted another go on the bike, Suzuki told us that they'd got a little treat for us instead. So what they did, they packed us into a minibus and they took us around the track and stopped just before Honda Hairpin after Stoner Corner. We just stopped there. And then uh, we were all looking at each other, wondering what's going on. And suddenly we heard this bike in the background hurtling towards us, round Stoners, round to Honda Hairpin, and it whooshed past the van, went off into the distance, and that was it. And what it was, was the new beaking that Suzuki had been um, showing at the bike shows and teasing us with, that was about to come out. And it was our, our treat to have a first glimpse of this bike, which we literally saw for about three seconds. By the time we got back to the pits in the van, Suzuki had packed it away. And then that was that, no one mentioned anything more about it. So um, we all would rather have had another session on the GSX-R than to see a beaking for three seconds, but that's the way it goes sometimes. But there you go. Thanks very much for your question. And finally, um, this one's from Stephen Chapman, 8344. Thanks very much for your question. Uh, great content. Thank you. Why are tyres such a personal thing? Every bike I've ever owned, I immediately put Metzler rubber on it. My current bike, S1000R, came with Dunlop Sport Smarts. I think they are even better. What are your personal thoughts and preferences? That's a great question. Um, well, Generally, when you buy a new bike, they come on original equipment tires called OE tires, and they're never, in general terms, that good. Because the manufacturers, bike manufacturers, work with the tire manufacturers who, who help them develop the bikes together. Um, everything's built down to a price, as we've said before, with bike components and tires are no exception. So when a bike comes on some standard original equipment rubber, it will be maybe not the full fat rubber that it might appear. The full fat rubber, the good stuff, is they're called replacement tires. They're the ones you buy in the shops. So you might have a tire X on a bike and a replacement tire X. They look identical, but they actually perform very differently. They might have different compounds, um, different constructions. One would be cheaper than the other, basically. And the way you can tell an OE tire from a replacement tire is that they've normally got a, a number after the tire name, which kind of designates the OE code. And ironically, OE tires, which you can only buy from a dealership, 
more expensive than the better replacement tires which you buy from a tire shop. So I can see why you know when you've put your Metzlers on and replaced the, the Dunlops there's been a big step up in performance because the Dunlop probably isn't the full fat Dunlop it's probably a build down to a price Dunlop. Dunlop and Bridgestones are generally the OE tires that um, are kind of affected the most by this. Generally Metzlers and Pirellis um, aren't as much but they do still make OE tires for certain bikes which aren't the same as the replacement tyres. But to kind of answer your question about why they're such personal things, um, we all ride so differently and you might find the sweet spot of a tyre that no one else might do. So for example, there was a phase when I was working at the Ron Aslan Race School where I really, it really kind of hit home about this. Not just how tyres feel, but how bikes feel. So when I was instructing it's generally road riders or track day riders um, that I was instructing there were one-on-one -on -one sessions on fire blades three hour stints and generally a road rider in in the cornering phase once you've let go of the brakes does almost the polar opposite on a motorcycle to a racer so a road rider will be braking when a racer is accelerating Racers leaning in a different way off the power, where a road rider would be leaning on the power as he as he goes through a corner. And um, you know, without going into massive detail here, I've talked about it before. But kind of, you know, going into a corner, a road rider will break at the same point as a racer, maybe. But then they kind of get on the throttle straight away and power through the corner, which is what you kind of do on the road. So all the way through the corner, as the bike's being lent, the bike's on the throttle. And then the bike's kind of getting a little bit squirrely and then they come out of the corner. Whereas a racer will break at the same time and be off the throttle all the way into the corner. So suddenly the bike's not under the, the force of acceleration anymore. It's just turning with no throttle and the bike feels completely different. So you're going to get a different experience on your bike as you would do on your tires as well, which is why sometimes road tests are so fundamentally different between road testers because they're riding completely differently. So, you know, that's why, you know, as a as a reader of a road test, if you can relate to a certain rider, tester, um, that you think you're close to, you might kind of get a better, a better kind of uh, idea of what the bike's like. Um, so the same goes with tires. If, if a tire is made in a certain way that it supports what you do on the bike, it supports your cornering when you're in a certain phase of a corner. It kind of supports the way you accelerate. No matter how you do it, you're going to get a different experience to, to somebody else, basically. I'd say professional riders and racers, because they all kind of ride the same, because you have to to be fast, they're all more or less the same technique, they'll all feel the same thing for a tyre. But when you've got road riders from learners, through to experienced riders to racers, you're doing such different things on the bike that the tire is going to talk to you in a different way, which is why tires are so personal. Um, even when I've done tire tests recently, I did a big sports touring tire test with Ride Magazine. The winner was unanimous because it's a it's a great tire, um, so that was unanimous. But our order for the rest of them, I think for second and third, was slightly different. The, the worst, even though it's still a good tyre, was unanimous as well. But between first and last, our opinions were slightly different, just because we ride differently. So, um, But that's a really interesting question. Um, but I think that, you know, when you're choosing tyres, it's a good idea to sort of do a lot of research and to, you know, maybe look at the, the ride and NCN sports touring tyre test and any other group test you can find. Motorrad magazine do really good and really thorough tyre tests with lots of different people as well. So all their opinions kind of get averaged out into a, a final score. But um, I could talk about tires all day. So that's it for me for this video. Thank you very much for sending all your questions in and I look forward to seeing you again very soon.